Hello, and welcome to Buckle Up. I'm Harry King, and this is my 1993 Ford Explorer. Well, I say it's mine, it's sort of my fiancé's. So as usual, we're going to start this review by talking about the exterior of the car, but unusually, I'm going to talk about general themes of the exteriors of first-gen Ford Explorers, and then I'm going to talk specifically about the car in front of you, because uh, this one's a wee bit different. Um, so, the front end of the Ford Explorer, first generation, was just a Ford Ranger. Um, and then moving back to turn it into an SUV, they just put a box on it, basically. So, not a huge amount of body styling going on there. There's this line that goes down the side of the body, and I believe you could get it in two-tone above and below that, and um, around the grille area there's some chrome, because it's American. But otherwise, not a huge amount stylingly to go off, it's just kind of a box, or two boxes, I guess. Now, this car specifically, you'll see on the front, it has these extra off-road lights fitted. They're very useful because the headlights are almost completely useless. I'll insert a shot of them in the dark for you now. Um, also, it has this black bonnet. That's not because the bonnet's been replaced. This is the original bonnet. Um, it's just been painted black so it doesn't reflect into your eyes in the sun, like on a rally car, except this is its definitely not a rally car. Um, also, I don't know if you can see from there, this car does have a sunroof. It's been sealed with bathroom sealant um, because it leaks quite badly. And then it also has a sort of homemade roof rack made out of steel box section, um, which I suspect is... Well, I'll show you some of the problems that's caused. Um, you can see already on the front, this is quite a lot of Bondo here. It's clearly been bashed and dinged about, I think, before I owned this vehicle. It was being used effectively as a pickup truck with the seats folded down, um, so it's been fairly abused. There's also quite a lot of um, sun scorching of the clear coat, so it's not really shiny anymore. It doesn't bother me, though. I quite like the way it looks, sort of bashed up. It's like a road-worn Stratocaster for people who like guitar. And then to round out the exterior, here we are at the back. Um, as you can see, there's some brown inserts here. That's a bit more Ford styling. Um, I'm not sure why, though, because there's not any more, like, dark brown on the rest of this exterior. I mean, I guess it's it's all kind of brown, but that's the only dark brown. Now, this is where I'm going to be able to best display the problems that I think have been caused by this aftermarket roof rack, is at some point it's been overloaded, it's pushed the roof down here, and now I can, like, fit my hand into the top of the tailgate. Um, so it, the tailgate doesn't really fit anymore. Um, and that's a problem that's only compounded because then when you open it, well, one, this is a 30-year-old truck, so the rear struts don't really work. They, um, they just kind of let it fall. And uh, I don't know if you can tell, but it, it leaks because of the gap above, above the door. And then also, um, the catches at the side don't actually align quite right anymore. So what I have to do when I want to close it is um, push this in here, like that, and then give it a really good old slam. Okay, so here is the boot. Here's how I access it most of the time because of the damaged struts and the whole problem opening and closing it thing. It is properly massive, and I would usually demonstrate this by climbing inside and sitting in it. Um, where I would have pointed out that it would be the ideal camera vehicle if we could get one in England, because you can prop this open, sit the camera out of the back, and you're sorted. But currently, it's full of water because it had... Well, there was quite a lot of heavy rain yesterday, and it, it, it came in around this gap up here, and it also comes in around the top of that window, um, because whoever installed this thing just drilled holes straight into the top of the vehicle, and... I, I'm not convinced it was a brilliant job. So let's talk about think, something that's relevant to everyone. How much space there is inside. So 
I'll hop into the back seats here. Um, I've left the air compressor by my feet. But as you can see, there's a decent amount of room for a fully grown adult. This seat is in my driving position. Lots of knee room. Um, I can just about get my feet under the seat in front. Lots of feet room and uh, a decent amount of headroom. A couple of inches to spare. So I reckon, you know, even fairly tall passengers would be fine. Um, what you might not be able to tell, it's no headrest. So in a rear end collision, you're just going backwards like that. Um, hurting your vertebrae, starting a lawsuit, all the fun stuff. Um, also in the center, there is only a lap belt. So generally we don't put people in this middle seat. We try and keep it as a, a four seater when we can, because that's just not as safe. Um, often though, we use that to attach the, uh, the dog's harnesses to, so that's quite handy. And having this bench seat here is quite handy for dogs. Less comfortable for people, but if you need to put dogs in the car, top spec which is what we're using it for most of the time so that's worked out for the best really not a lot going on there's uh, no door pockets there are grab handles there's no seat back pockets the, 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 it's very very spartan very very bare um and it sort of feels almost more like a work truck than a family vehicle you can kind of feel the ranger roots here um i imagine a ranger crew cab would have a similar bench seat in the back but yeah um it's not not a great place to be comfortable but i i'm sort of uneasy about the safety aspect of it let's move to the front now things here in the front are much better for a start i have a head restraint it's fixed into the seat not adjustable but even for me it's just about tall enough to uh, prevent my head from going backwards so that's a big plus um there are no airbags though, anywhere in this car. 1993, airbags was starting to be pretty common, um, especially in larger luxury family vehicles. But the, this doesn't have any, which is a, a bit of a downside, uh, slightly unfortunate. Otherwise, this is where the radio would live, and this is the mess of cables that prevents me from wanting to do anything about fixing it. You have a steering wheel, and you have the normal things behind the steering wheel um, and also slightly abnormal for our British viewers probably that these are quite uncommon this is a uh, an automatic gear shift column shifter so this is my park reverse neutral drive etc um, you sort of get these on a Mercedes but it's not quite it's not quite the same physical big lever as it is in here otherwise uh, other slight oddities there's also no handbrake the uh, the parking brake is down here it's foot operated and a little release lever above it again slightly like a mercedes i believe um big steering wheel definitely from a truck um with cruise control controls on it but one i can't make them work and two i believe there's um some faults related to the cruise controls in these Gen 1 and Gen 2 Explorers, so it's probably best that they don't work. A big indicator and windshield wiper control on this side. And then this little one here is to control the, um, well, technically it's to control the rake of the steering wheel, but it, it doesn't really operate like any other steering wheel rake I've ever used. Um, you pull it in quite hard, and then the steering wheel tilts at the end of the column. So rather than the column moving up and down with you, the just the steering wheel does, which is it's kind of odd. Um, so I have it in the highest setting, just because that's what's most comfortable for me. Um, but it, it means if you want it in your lowest setting, it becomes sort of completely flat. And if you want it as high up as possible, it gets more bus-like as, as you require it to be higher up. It's, so yeah, a bit weird. Uh, HVAC controls here, very simple, two sliders and a knob. Um, doesn't really work, only works if you turn it all the way onto high. Um, so, again, I, I tend to just use the windows down. I would like to be able to use the sunroof as well, but I, I can't have leaking front seats. That's, it, it, yeah, it defeats the point of having a car if you can't get out of the rain. Um, there's this sort of center console down here. It's where we keep our hand sanitizer, sunglasses, and there are two cup holders. They're only really good for cans though because um, they have these things that raise up to hold them in extra securely but anything bigger than like a coke can 
doesn't fit in the raised up bit. So then you're forced to have them down and then they're only about an inch and a half high and still quite small. So things fall over. If you have a 500 mil bottle, it'll just fall over. Um, I have all of the various electric controls for the windows and things here, um, as well as a door lock and um, what claims to be electric mirror controls, but the mirrors aren't electric. I do them by hand. Also, final little additions of practicality. There's a sensor console here as well, um, but it's also a seat back, which is slightly odd. This is technically a seat. There's a lap belt again. Don't really use it. Only use the lap belt for dogs. And there's also a glove box, which has the worst action of any glove box I've ever known. Nice. Finally, we have the, uh, the sun visors. You do have two of them, like a Bentley Bentayga. Pretty much the only similarity of the Bentley Bentayga, but um, that's enough faffing with sun visors and storage cubbies though. Let's go for a drive. So let's fire up this uh, monster of a vehicle. Well, monster of a old V6 anyway. You might have heard the locks going there. They just do that when I turn the key for some reason. And, and again. Mmm. Fruity. Uh, where should we go? Let's let's go and see how it does off the beaten path first. I'll take you to some of the uh, the rougher roads in the local area in terms of surface rather than you know social standing. Um, well, you might already be able to see these aren't exactly the smoothest roads you might find. They're certainly um, they would give Manchester a run for its money. But it does get worse than this. It, it does. It, get, it also gets a lot better in some places, but you may have noticed, by the way, I am wearing a different T-shirt. Uh, that's because I filmed the other part of this review yesterday, um, and then it started raining. And as you may have noticed, I also have the windows open because of the aircon issue. So um, trying to film in the rain wouldn't really have been great because half of me would have got soaked and it would have been even noisier than it is now. So I elected to shoot later on, and, um, and then that evening I spilled ketchup on my t-shirt, so that's the continuity error for you there. Okay, so it might not look like it, but this, ahead of us, is a road that I will now drive down. Uh, this is a road I use on a regular basis. And actually, I don't need the four-wheel drive for this so much, unless it's really been raining. Um, but the ground clearance is a massive help. It's an ever-changing surface for a start. Every time it rains, the surface of this road changes as well. Uh, and as you can see, the drainage here isn't brilliant, so you kind of just have to roll with it. Um, uh, this is this is quite a big hole here. There we go. Oh, and down. And then um, this is just about the uh, biggest hole on the road. That's why I got this car is because it can do this without really um, blinking an eye, thankfully. Okay. Bit of a water obstacle there. Got through that, no bother. Smells a little bit of excrement, but that's fine. In terms of actual driving experience, now I've shown you the reason I drive a vehicle like this, um, you might have noticed the steering wheel isn't exactly sitting straight. Now it is. Now it isn't, now it is. I haven't moved at all in terms of what direction my wheels are pointing. Uh, so yeah, quite a lot of play in the steering. It's a recirculating ball system, 
uh, like you would find on an old G-Wagon or a current Suzuki Jimny. So quite old fashioned. Um, I believe it's supposed to be better for off-roading because it's less likely to kick back to, back at you. But um, as a payment for that, it's also completely numb to any sort of feeling. And it's a huge amount of turns locked to lock. It's more than four turns locked to lock in this car. Um, so when you're going around a tight corner, you really have to move the wheel a very long way. The steering wheel itself, as well as having no feel, it's massive, again, definitely from a truck. This one has um, a nice cover on it. Well, I say nice cover, it's relatively nice, actually. It's uh, vinyl, I believe, rather than leather. But it's cream, importantly. The actual steering wheel is black. And in a hot day, or on a hot day even, when the sun's been beating down on the interior of the car, I'm very thankful that this is a light-coloured cover, because if it wasn't, I mean, oh, I would burn my hands a lot. The seats definitely feel trucky in their nature. They kind of belong, they're big, wide and flat, relatively cushioned, um, but not actually supportive per se. Uh, and especially for me, the, the headrest doesn't quite come to where you'd want it to, where, which is slightly inconvenient. Visibility is, a sort of, it's a two-part story. Out of the front and out of the side, it's great. Um, in period, when this car came out, they described it as having quite a low seating position. They described it as a car you sat in rather than on. Um, and yeah, you're probably a little bit lower down than you would be in a Land Rover, but compared to today's crossover SUVs, it's relatively commanding. I can easily see the corners of the bonnet, for example, and what it means is I also have a decent amount of headroom. Because um, you could have the seat jacked up higher if you wanted, but you would be against the ceiling. Um, but also the windows, the, the windscreen, uh, they're all nice and big. They're easy to see out of. And um, with this additional extra mirror ridge here, great. The downside is these wing mirrors. The little circle mirrors on the end block out quite a lot of information that you want to see big and just show it to you slightly smaller which isn't really useful. Brake and throttle feel. The brake pedal is quite grabby. Um, this vehicle has discs in the front and drums in the rear, as is the 90s style. So um, I think what's happened is maybe the rear drums haven't been serviced. I don't have a space to work on this car, really, anywhere. Um, and what happens is the back wheels like to lock up really, really quickly. So something is wrong somewhere, which is true of a lot of this car, actually. Um, but something wrong is, is wrong somewhere, so the back wheels do like to lock up. Luckily, they only like to lock up when I'm already going below 15 miles an hour, let's say. So if I have to brake hard on the highway or something, generally it slows down progressively, and then for the last little bit, it, it skids which, you know, makes it nice and butt clenching just at the end there, but it's mostly fine. And the throttle pedal is remarkably unresponsive. I guess that's partly due to what is a fairly lazy torque converter gearbox. I'll happily let you labor or lather power into the, um, into the torque converter itself and then just spin it away without achieving anything. Um, so this is light throttle and then that's sort of mid throttle and then that's high throttle, but it, it's sort of, it's, it's like an incremental switch rather than a smooth travel, as it were. And there's no clutch pedal to speak of, so I don't have to talk about that. Um, I don't know what a clutch pedal would be like in one of these. Probably also weird, just like the other two pedals. The engine, 155 horsepower, so pretty much exactly the same as my Jag, bizarrely. Even though it's got nearly double the displacement. Um, and a four-speed auto with an overdrive, so all your acceleration is operating in four gears. But actually the acceleration isn't terrible. I, I expected this to be some kind of awful, slow, old bus. Uh, and it's somewhere in the 10 second range to 60, which, you know, is not fast in, by any means, but a Defender is the far side of 15 seconds. 
even for like a 2016 Defender, I'm talking about the old Defender here, obviously, you know, and, and the Mitsubishi Shogun Sport, again, north, north of 15 seconds, and these are vehicles that are similar, they're, they're you know, body on frame SUVs in the Shogun Sports case it's actually based on a pickup truck just like this is uh, and both of them well the Defender's older and newer bizarrely um, but yeah they're both contemporary and or sold newer than this so actually this is fine it's faster than my Ford Focus was which is just that's kind of silly but um, it, it means it's it's quite livable even in modern traffic it you don't feel like you've been completely shafted now if you wanted to overtake someone on a single lane road it's still not it's not brilliant um i'd far rather have the jag for that and my god on a curvy road it is quite a handful Okay, so here we go. Sort of more like the equivalent of a British B road, except um, not quite as smooth. So as you can probably see, it's uh, a tad b bumpy. Um, and then you get people like this who are just hanging about. So you, um, you, you go for those overtakes when you can get them. Oh God, oh God, I've lost you. I'm going to have to fix you. Especially the rear end, when it's empty, it's very, very bouncy because you've got to remember this is effectively a pickup truck. So in the back are leaf springs and leaf springs operate best when they're under high amounts of compression. So yeah, on, on road suspension, not, not as good as it could be. Now this car was available with a, uh, a five-speed manual transmission and I do wish I could have found one with that but I believe they're quite rare, probably even rarer now um, and probably it was a better find to find a four-wheel drive one than find a manual one. It's probably actually more useful to me in the real world even though I would have enjoyed a manual more. I'm imagining that the, the gear shift wasn't the best ever. Now, I probably should address the title of this video, the whole Ford Exploder thing. Um, accident waiting to happen. Well, is it? So, I've scoured the online forums and I've tried to work out what specifically the name Ford Exploder comes from and people have different answers, which is always helpful. But I'll try and cover the main ones I've seen. So, there are three claims as to the Ford Exploder name. Number one, engines for timing chains or timing belts uh, and it's an interference engine and it goes wrong on this car that's blatantly not true 290,000 miles original engine it's just been it's been serviced regularly and properly and that has kept it in tip-top shape second one transmission the four speed with the overdrive they explode that's one of the claims um or you know destroyed themselves i think what's a nice word for a stupid person yanks i think they keep trying to tow with this vehicle and forgetting to lock it out of uh, the overdrive and they let it go into overdrive and the transmission overheats and that's that again original transmission 290,000 miles And then probably the most notorious one is more specific to the Gen 2 Explorers, but it's uh, that they have high-speed blowouts. Now, there was a lawsuit about this, and the ultimate conclusion of the lawsuit was it was due to a failure and tread detachment of the OEM-provided uh, tyres, which obviously aren't on this vehicle anymore. So in terms of an accident waiting to happen, not really worried about this car, 
um, if you still have your original tyres on your Ford Explorer, what the hell are you doing? At this point, any tyre will be bad, uh, you know, once it's been 30 years, so sort that out. But I think if you buy one of these these days, probably it's going to be okay. You know, it, it's hard to say that definitively. Obviously, cars can go wrong. But I think if something goes wrong at this point, it's due to age or use rather than being an intrinsic manufacturer flaw, uh, which this got saddled with quite badly. And I haven't noticed the same level of criticism leveled towards, say, the Chevy um, Blazer or the Dodge Durango or other cars of this ilk. And I suspect that's partially due to the fact that this sold in such huge numbers that, of course, there were going to be issues. Every car has issues. Every car ever has had issues. Toyota Camrys can have issues. I know it's scary to hear it, but I'm telling you the truth. And it's because I love you. So I think just because there's such a huge number of these, things came up. And the tyre thing was bad luck, but ultimately it wasn't Ford's fault-ish. So, Ford Exploder, it's kind of a funny name, but I think ultimately it's only as true as any of these rumours about horrific failure on a vehicle. You know, at this point you're buying a nearly 30 year old vehicle, the ones that are going to die have died. They're gone. You're safe. You just have to worry about all the other things you worry about with old vehicles, which is anything breaking. I think that's just about all the driving I need to do, so let's go back and I will do a conclusion. So what are my final thoughts on the Ford Explorer? Well it's definitely not for everyone, uh, it's rough on road uh, but surprisingly useful off it, uh, but you can definitely feel its uh, truck underpinnings. I personally think though it's very charming potentially because it's so rough, uh, and I really like it. I would absolutely buy another one again if, uh, if I had the opportunity. Thank you for watching, guys. Please remember to like, comment down below, and most importantly, subscribe. You'll find all of our social media links in the description, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of those. And we have a Patreon if you would like to support us and... Um, and make us do more cool stuff, let us do more cool stuff even, then you can support us there. Or if you want to support us in another way, we have merchandise, we have a merchandise store, the link for that is also in the description. You go buy absolutely lovely merch. Um, I own a bunch of it, because I like it so much. Um, and yeah, thank you, see you next time.